Well, good morning, everyone. Excited to have you again for part two of our new series, Off the Chain. This is actually all about the tearing down of strongholds in our lives. If you missed last week's message, you can always jump online. Maybe you're watching from social media somewhere on a page out there. We want to say we're so excited to have you engaging with us as well. You can also jump on at peakcity.church forward slash messages to be able to watch last week's messages and other ones that have been shared here in the past. Last week was more of the theology behind what strongholds are uh, and the simple steps that we're going to take over the next few weeks as we talk about tearing those things down in our life because these are things that we all face together. So this week and the, for the next two weeks following, we're actually specifically going to talk about some strongholds that we all deal with. Now, granted, this could be like a 38-week series if we started talking about all the strongholds that we face, right? And by the way, it's okay to chuckle if you, if you want me to think that I'm funny, and I'm not really. It still helps my heart a little bit. Uh, also, if you want me to preach faster, say amen more. <laughs> See? Oh, <laughs> hey, man. Oh, just hurry up, Nate. Anyway, uh, it's okay to respond here. and be, you know, If you think the preacher's preaching good, if you don't, you can say help him, Jesus, or whatever you've got to do. Uh, we're glad to have you. So we're going to talk for the next couple of weeks about strongholds in particular that I think many of us, if not all of us, on some weeks will face. So we're going to throw our theme verse up for this series. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. Now, the Bible says this. This is the Apostle Paul saying, For though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. So when we talk about a spiritual battle, get it out of your head that this isn't the physical battle. It's a spiritual battle. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. The first thing that we need to, to really grasp out of the second half of this verse is it's not our effort that's ever going to see us free from sin in our life. Listen, there's no good thing that you can do. There's no self health book, help, health, health, yes, self help book you can read. There's no every day's a Friday sermon out there that you can listen to that's going to get your gaze shifted and just get your heart fixed and right and ready. It's actually going to have to be the power of God working through his spirit in your life to see strongholds torn down. That's, praise God. I got, I got a couple of witnesses here in the room. So it's not about us. It says we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. Now remember what we talked about last week. When it comes to tearing down strongholds, these are lies that the enemy tells us and that we just start to believe them. Because the bottom line is the only time that a lie has power in your life is when you start to believe it. That's right. Help me preach some more. That's good. We, we, so we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion. We tear down the lie, right? Raised against the knowledge of God, that's the truth. So we are going to replace the lies of the enemy with the truth of the Lord's word, okay? We're going to replace that with the truth of God and take, thank you so much, brother, going to take every thought captive to be obedient to Christ. Now, things will always come into the field of our vision that will be temptations for us. It doesn't go away. There's no promise in all of Scripture that you're going to reach this place of spiritual perfection where you're not even tempted by anything anymore. Jesus himself, the Bible says, was tempted in every way that we're tempted. But in the midst of that temptation, we are going to find strength to say to those thoughts that enter our mind, no, you do not have authority in this house. You're not going to have influence over my decisions. I'm going to make you submit to the will of Jesus Christ. And we're going to see strongholds torn down from within our hearts. So that's how it happens. We destroy the lies, replace them with the truth of God. So stronghold. Now, this is a word in the Greek, and I have a hard time pronouncing these, and there's a, there's a Greek prop in here. Ochruoma, I think is how we actually say this, uh, this word in the Greek here. And that literally, by a stripped down, easy definition that I can give you, would mean a prisoner that's locked by deception, all right? In other words, you're trapped by lies. So when we think about it this way, it was like the illustration of the elephant that we gave last week. Remember, an elephant, when they, when they want an elephant to travel in a circus, they put this gigantic chain around its leg and tighten it down, and they, put, they attach him to a large stake into the ground that 
that even the elephant can't pull away from. And they leave him on this chain for a couple of weeks, and within two or three weeks' time, after training him to know that he can't escape that shackle, they just take a little stake, and they tap it in the ground, they put a rope around that, and they tie a rope around the elephant's leg, and he will submit to that yoke of bondage because he believes that he's completely trapped by it. When he's a step away from his freedom, you see, that is what a stronghold is. It is a prisoner locked by deception. You have some kind of construct in your mind saying that this is how it is, that this is what you're stuck with, that this is who you are. And God says that he wants you to break off the chain of bondage and be free and step into that freedom. You're a moment away. You're a step away. You're a cry out to Jesus away from freedom. So a prisoner locked by deception. Another way to put it is that you're living life by something that is not true. Your compass is a lie. Your direction in life is a lie. So our goal today is to expose the lie, to replace it with God's truth. And as we do that today, we're going to touch on a subject that I think really affects all of us, even if you may not think that. Because we're going to talk about the stronghold of addiction. Today we're going to talk about the stronghold of addiction. This isn't a message that's for people that just, you know, struggle with alcoholism or drugs or opiates or just can't stop looking at pornography. Or It's not just for people that find themselves uh, in, in these deep secret kind of sins they don't want to reveal or talk about. We all find ourselves leaning in to this temptation towards this stronghold of addiction in some form or fashion in our lives. But I want us to be aware of what that looks like, okay? So I'm preaching to people all across the room today. This is a message for people that have been believers for as long as they can remember, for people that met Jesus yesterday. By the way, if you did, I want to walk with you. I think you need to be a part of a church, and you're in a great one right now, so I'd love to see you again next Sunday. Hey, listen, and if you don't know who Jesus is, this is a great message for you to hear as well. I think it's going to stretch us all and pull us forward. So let's talk about addiction as for what it is, okay? If I was going to give you a simple definition, addiction is anything that I do that I don't want to do, but, and I was really careful about this last line here, but I won't stop doing. Let's read the definition together, church, can we? Addiction, anything that I do that I don't want to do, but I won't stop doing. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say I can't stop doing. You may feel a compulsion to do something in your life. You may be struggling with a sin, and you feel a compulsion to sin, but it's not a matter of can't. It's a matter of won't because, again, we're going to strip down the lies of the enemy, and we're going to replace them with God's truth, and we're going to see how he's going to bring about freedom in our hearts. And for many of us today, that applies directly to us. So I'm preaching to me too today. So let's look at what the scripture says. I'm going to give us a little, a little piece of, of Romans chapter 7, and I'm going to circle back to it. But if you've got your Bibles, I'm going to read Romans 7, 21 through 24. If you don't, we're going to put it on the side screens. And the Bible says it like this, because this isn't a new problem, church. This isn't, addiction is not something that just popped up in recent times. But the Bible speaks extremely clearly to people that struggle with addiction in their life. Here's what, here's what Paul says. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Anybody ever been there? I want to do the right thing, but the temptation is so great right in front of me. Verse 22 says, For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin, that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am. Have you ever struggled to the point where you just feel like there's no fight in you and you feel just defeated and you look back at your life and say, I just, it's like I'm not even trying to not be a slave to addiction. For some of us, that's hitting home right now. This is the Apostle Paul, the guy that, that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, uh, the man that the Lord used to plant the early churches we know it today he's saying that he struggles just like you do and he asked the question who will deliver me from this body of death right and we're going to come back to that but he's here asking this very difficult question 
even the Apostle Paul. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to expose the lies and reveal the truth. So I want to talk to you today about some addiction lies, all right? And here's the first one that I want to share with you. Addiction wants to become part of your identity. Identity. Addiction wants to become part of your identity. Now, look, I... I love the work that 12-step programs do. I believe in them, and they, they do some great things for people, so I support that work. But there is something that they say that I cannot get on board with. They will tell you, hey, even if you've been 25 years clean and sober, you introduce yourself and say, my name's Bob, and I'm an alcoholic. Listen, I want to tell you today that strongholds the enemy wants to weave into your life are going to make you think that you always are what you were. That you always will be what you did or what you're doing. And here's what I want to say to you today. That those who are in Christ Jesus are free indeed. He says that the old is gone. That's not my word. That's God's word. He says that the new has come. He's made you a new creation. In other words, you might have been an alcoholic or a drug addict. But right now, if you've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, he says that you're no longer a sinner. You're a saint in the eyes of God because he looks on you and sees the same righteousness as his son, Jesus. He doesn't look at you for what you were. He looks at you for what you can become, for who he is going to make you to be. That's good news. But a lot of us sit back and say, I just am that thing. I'm an addict. I'm a liar. I'm just prideful. I'm just angry and hateful. That's who I am. No, no, no. You see, the enemy will lie to you. So we're going to strip down the lies of the enemy and replace them with God's truth. And some of you guys, some of you get cute about it. You're like, well, you know, I struggle with drinking, and my daddy was a drunk, and my granddaddy was a drunk, and my great-granddaddy, he lived in Ireland. So, I mean, come on, right? You know? No. Listen. No, no, no. That, that leads me into another thing that a lot of Christian people believe. Now, some of you are newer to church, and you don't know what this is. I'm going to explain it to you. So if this is your first introduction to this, I am so glad that you're here. Let's talk about generational curses. Okay? Now, there are people out there that will say that there are generational curses that are just on my family. And Lord, I just, I can't break free of the generational curse because the sins of the father have been passed down to me. I'm going to pass them down to my kids and they're going to pass them down to their kids. They, they believe this. Let me ask you a question. For the people in the room, and I'm not, I, I'm, there's some in the room that probably do believe this. I'm not trying to insult you. I'm approaching you with love in the heart of a pastor, wanting to, to bring us and gather us around the gospel. We're going to go to what the word says. It's not my opinion. We're going to go with what the word of God says, okay? So in the Old Testament, who was it that put the generational curse on people? I heard it. It was God. How do we couch that in our New Testament theology of generational curses? Because I've never heard anyone say, God's putting a generational curse on my family. Not once. It's because he's not doing that. It's because this idea of generational curses was something that happened in the Old Testament because of the disobedience of the children of Israel. God's people didn't want to love him and serve him. And as a result, they were bringing a curse on themselves from God. And then as we go through hundreds of years of New Testament history, Old Testament, rather, history, we come to another scripture, and it's in the book of Ezekiel. Now, I love the way Eugene Peterson spoke to this in the message. And it's so practical and punchy that I'm going to read it from that. I typically read from the English Standard Version. But check this out. Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 2 and 3, if you're a note taker. So this is speaking to generational curses that had been a part of the lives and culture of people. And then God spoke through the prophet, I think it was Jeremiah, and said this, God's message to me, what do you people mean by going around the country repeating the saying, the parents ate green apples, the children got the stomachache? Seriously. As sure as I'm the living God, you're not going to repeat this saying in Israel any longer. Every soul, man, woman, child, belongs to me, parent and child alike. You die for your own sin, not another's. It was done in the Old Testament. Some of us have held on to this, and I'll tell you why. Because you've gotten used to this excuse of saying, well, there's a reason beyond my control for why I'm this way. That is a lie from Satan. 
and you get comfortable with an excuse and you don't want to move forward and allow God to free you from these chains of bondage. Don't live in the lie anymore. Understand that you can be free in Jesus by his power and strength. Again, we don't wage war in the flesh, but rather with these spiritual weapons that are mighty to the tearing down of strongholds, not because they come from our power, but because they come from the Spirit of God. Am I preaching to somebody this morning? Come on now. Okay, so this is what we're talking about. Generational curse, lie. When I try, now listen, let me say this though. There is learned behavior. I'm not trying to step back and say that there's learned behavior that comes from your daddy or your mama that you've learned and that's been projected onto you and you may be projecting onto someone else, but call it what it is. You learned it from somebody else and garbage in, garbage out, Right? This is why 21 days of prayer and fasting is so important for our church. People wonder why we're doing this for the second time this year. Like it's like a spiritual oil change. It knocks the crud out of your soul, if I'm going to put it real practically here, okay? <laughs> I'm just, I'm telling you, it is like an atomic bomb against strongholds in your life. If you will take time to say no to some things that you crave, that desire your time and your focus, and say, God, I'm going to devote that to you, watch what he does when he starts to reorder your life. Watch what he does when he starts to put the pieces of your life that you just can't figure out where these tabs are supposed to go back together. Because the more you do that, when you yield those things to him, guess what else you're doing? You're yielding your heart to him. You're yielding your spirit and your soul to him. You're yielding your body to him so that he can do with you what he wills and he pleases. It's my desire, and I hope that's yours too. Another lie, another lie. When I try to quit but fail, I feel increasingly hopeless. Anybody ever tried something? You really tried at it and you failed? Hey, my hand's in the air. Listen, you're not alone in that. Like, I think about my daughter, Eva. She tried out for her first school play last year. It was Annie. Adorable. My daughter, oh, so cute. Like, I can't hardly stand how cute she is. And she can sing, and if she couldn't, I would tell her, okay? Because I don't want her to go on American Idol and get Simoned one day. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I love my child enough to tell them what their strengths look like and encourage them away from the things maybe that aren't going to ever be strengths. Some of y'all auditioning for the worship team up in here need to hear what I just said. Come on. Mm. Anyway, I'm sorry. Don't, don't, aw. It's the truth. John, I'm, I'm putting change in your pocket right now, brother. It's, it's not him that said no, it was me. No, I'm just... <laughs> She auditioned for the play and she didn't make it. She was so disappointed and deflated. She cried and cried. And, I was, and what I said was I gave her a big hug and I told her I was so proud of how she tried her best. And then I said, baby, what are we going to audition for next? She said, no, 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 daddy. I don't want to do that because I might not make it. I said, baby, you never say no to something for fear of failure if you know there's something in your heart that God might want to use you to do. And, I, and so I'm encouraging her to get back up on the horse and take another step because I don't want her to live in this guise and this lie that the enemy wants to draw us into at such a young age to say, when I try to quit but fail, I feel increasingly hopeless. Listen. Why so downcast, oh my soul, put your hope in God. Somebody needs to receive that to themselves today. You feel downtrodden and hopeless because that's the way it's always been. It doesn't have to be that way. Look, God can absolutely do anything in and through you. I serve a God who freed people from slavery in Egypt, and they walked into the sea, and behind them there was an army, the strongest one in the world, that was going to kill them all. And my God made a way where there was no way. And if he had to part the waters of the sea so that they could walk across, he can deliver you too. Don't accept the lies of the enemy that say, I can't, and it's just hopeless, and this is the way it's going to be. That is a lie from the devil. Mm. I'm going to keep on preaching until this caffeine wears off. <laughs> How about this? Isaiah 43, 18 through 19. Remember the former things. Remember not the former things. Nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Will, do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I will make things go where they don't normally go if that's what it takes to see you free from what's got you shackled and burdened. This is what God says to you, his beloved 
child, you can be free. You can be free. How about this lie? Any threat to my addiction becomes a threat to me. Any threat to my addiction becomes a threat to me. Look, it's, it's fine if you deal with it privately and quietly, but if somebody that loves you in your life says anything about it, what do you want to do? You declare war, don't you? Oh, don't you talk to me about my drinking problem. Your son comes to you and loves dad. It, you just you get really angry sometimes. Um, maybe, maybe we could talk to somebody to help you with that. You don't understand what I've been through. You don't understand my mother's relationship. Leave me alone. Just leave me to anything that threatens your addiction becomes a threat to you. You see, it's not, but you think that it is because your whole life, the ecosystem you dwell in, your whole social construct and the way you think is so tied up in that addiction that you think to be free from that's going to destroy everything about who you are and that it's just too difficult to come back from that and you don't want to deal with anybody that wants to help you out of it because it's a threat to who you are. Here's another lie. I begin to lose my life. I begin to lose my life. You feel like, how about let me frame it this way. There's just too much water that's gone under the bridge. Or had I just changed a long time ago, man, God could really have done something through my life. Listen, that is a lie from the devil. I don't care who you are from 8 to 80 or even younger, man, from birth until you are dead. If there is breath in your lungs, God has a purpose and a plan for your life. Like, I, listen, I am baffled by some people and this wonderful thing that they call retirement. And some of you in the room just dream about this. You like salivate, oh, retirement. <laughs> the day when all I have to do is decide where I want to eat breakfast and that's it. You know? I, it blows my mind. Like, I, if we approach retirement as I'm just going to sit and do nothing and that's going to be the rest of my days and how I'm going to spend it. Wow, thanks a lot, guys. Good job with that. Great. Way to make an impact in the world. There's some people out there that hunger for it in a way that inspires me to the day where I might get to step into something like that, too, where they say, you know what? It's the day where I'm free to do anything I want for Jesus, and he's free to do and send me in places that I've never been before and stretch me in ways I've never been stretched before and work through me in a way I've never seen before. See, there's a difference there. What your heart longs for is not going to define anything but every decision that you make, just those. What does your heart long for? Because at the end of the day, if you sit here and you, you excuse away your life now because of everything that's passed and say, I'm beginning to lose my life, like too much time has passed by, I'm no longer effective, you're buying into a lie from the enemy because the truth of God is this. He can do more in your life in the latter days than he did in the former Think about, think about it this way. What if I tried to plant Peak City Church when I was 20 years old? Ain't nobody interested in what I got to say at 20 years old. <laughs> haven't lived, haven't made any decisions, haven't hurt, haven't experienced the things that God was building into me to experience, to be able to be used by him to build into someone else's life. That church would have been old, cold, and dead by about month six had I done something. So, you know, God has a purpose and a plan for you now. We talked about this two weeks ago. We said, when's the best time to plant a tree? Some of you guys go 20 years ago. Okay, you're looking back with the wrong eyes and you're buying into the lie. The best time to plant a tree? Right now. Sow seeds of life right now. Submit your heart and your life to God and say, look, I know you can take what I've got left and make it so much better than I ever could. It's yours. Lay your life down and surrender to him. Don't believe a lie that says that too much time has passed. That there's just so much that's already happened. Think about it this way. There's a reason why the rear view mirror is this big and the windshield's this big. Come on. That, that one even, that actually, that was in the notes. I got it in there. That's good. So. <laughs> Do we know the promises of God? He spoke through the Apostle Paul in Romans 8 when he said, And we know for that those who love God, all things work together for the good of them, for those who are called according to his purpose. God will take the mess of your past and make it the message of your future if you would simply say it belongs to you. Rebuild the pieces of my broken life. Here's another lie. I ease the pain by getting my next fix. You don't ease the pain. You think that you do what you do. You mask it. It's like you're just kind of covering up the problem with the, the small amount of pleasure you may derive from whatever that addiction is, and it brings you right back into that black hole of suffering and guilt and shame. 
And that's not the way that God designed you. And Paul leads us through in the book of Romans in chapter 7 and pulls us into chapter 8. And he really speaks directly to what this lie looks like. Okay? Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you the truth here. Don't ever for a second sit back and feel like you need this to get by. You see, the problem is you've replaced a false functional Savior in your heart to lord over your life instead of allowing the living God to breathe his life in and through you. And it's only going to lead you further down a path of destruction if that's the thing, that substance or that feeling or, or that deception or whatever that is that you hold on to just to get by in your life. You ease the pain by getting the next fix. That is a lie from the enemy. Paul says it this way. He says, I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one that can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? See, now Paul, he's saying this. It sounds like he's, he's really crying out, but he's really preaching to us here. And so he, he comes with us and gives us the answer. He says, the answer, thank God, is that Christ Jesus can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all of my heart and mind. I'm going to tell you now, right now, here in August, the rest of 2018 can be better than the first three quarters of it if you'll simply surrender your life to Him. If you'll stop buying into these lies of addiction. Romans 7, 24 and 25, it goes on to say, but I am pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. In other words, I want to do good. I want to be obedient and walk in God's will, but I feel this thing pulling me in another direction. It's something that we all struggle with, and some of you feel the weight of guilt and shame on your life, and you're believers. You've, you've received Christ into your life. You are walking with Jesus, but you've got this struggle that's crept up in, and you feel nothing but guilt and shame. Listen, listen, listen. The Bible says, for there is now no condemnation for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. You can be free from these things. You don't have to be a slave to them. Don't believe the lie that would say that you can ease the pain by getting your next fix. Now look, I, I want us to, to kind of forge ahead here. I've got a lot to say and a little time to say it. Virtually everyone that is dealing with a stronghold of some kind has got the root of that stronghold and the word that I'm going to share with you next. Okay, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but I wanted to circle back and really drill down on this. What it really comes down to is idolatry. What it comes down to is idolatry. All right, now, idolatry, if I was going to give you a simple definition, it's like this. Anything we allow to sit on the throne of our hearts other than God. Anything that we allow to sit on the throne of our hearts other than God, that is by definition idolatry. And so anytime we have this inordinate relationship with a thing, that thing will have the power to control you. Mark Driscoll said it this way. Pastor Mark said, people tend to not, not just take ugly things, but they take good things. They make them God things. And that's a bad thing. See, Satan is cunning. He's not going to try, like we said a few weeks back, he's not going to try to let Satan sit on the throne of your heart. He doesn't want you to be convinced to go to the first church of Satan and, you know, get a, get a pentagram tattoo somewhere on your body. Like, that's not his goal. He takes something good and wholesome, and he says he wants that to sit on the throne of our hearts. And listen, it's not just the devil working in our flesh. We do this naturally. Why? Because our, our hearts... They're like idol factories. We're wired and created to worship. This is what God made us to do. And it's so easy for us to get our eyes taken off of Jesus and start worshiping created things rather than creator God who is forever praised. That is idolatry. I mean, do you know why you remain a slave to this thing you struggle with most in your life? I shared this, I think, with this congregation last week. The 9 o'clock didn't get to hear it, so they heard it this morning. But I want to remind us. The reason is, is simple, but for some people it's just devastating. It can rock you to the core if you think about it. That one thing that you struggle with over and over and over again in your life, the reason that you do, the reason that you struggle with it is because you love it. That's the reason. It's because you love it. It's not 
a, a flirtation kind of thing that's just kind of fun on the side here. No, no, no. We're not talking about just some kind of little casual existence with this thing. It's not a habit. It's a love. It's not an addiction. It's a passion. I mean, have you guys ever seen the show Malcolm in the Middle? It's off the air, but they had this quirky dad that went later to become a meth cook, apparently, on another television show. Um, his, name was, his name was Hal, and he had this quirky personality to where he would just get hooked on whatever hobby he had. And he would go all out for this hobby, and it would be ridiculous. Like one time he wanted to roller skate, and he bought these roller skates, and he depleted the bank account of the entire family and just devoted his life to trying to become this roller disco guy or something ridiculous like that. Now, that's a good caricature of what this looks like because what we fall in love with, we become obsessed with. And what we become obsessed with, we imitate. And what we imitate, we're going to become. And what we become will have the power to control us. Why do you think that I keep on reaching out week in and week out and saying, fall in love with God, fall in love with God, fall in love with Jesus. Let your heart be completely sold out and surrendered to him. Because what you fall in love with, through that whole process, eventually you're going to become like. And I want us to become like Jesus. Because you're always going to be a slave to whatever is on the throne of your heart. Whatever that is, that's what you're going to be a slave to and surrendered to. So what is sitting there? What gets the first place in your heart? Because therein lies the solution. I mean, you can try every method in the world to be free from something, but until you actually allow the king of kings to have control of your heart first, you will have no success. Listen, it's a heart check. We need to dethrone the God of addiction and enthrone the living God into our heart because this matter is spiritual. Say it with me. It's spiritual. I'm not the guy that goes looking for a demon under every rock. Like, you know, if, if you get a speeding ticket and you're one of those folks that's like, well, you know, the Lord was just really trying to teach you to slow down. That's, that's, that's what he was, if he was teaching anything, take your foot off the gas and pay attention to the speed limit, right? Like, it's, that's, my, that's my personal opinion on many things that we attribute to more spiritual matters. Like, Oh, man, you know, I've, been, I just, I've been trying to lose weight, but I've gained 16 pounds. I think the Lord's trying. No, 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 no. What you need to do is, is take steps. If you really feel like weight loss is something that you need to do to actually do that and stop, like, secretly going downstairs and depleting the cookie jar every night after midnight, you know, or what, whatever those steps need to be. Don't attribute normal fleshly stuff sometimes to Satan because it's not always him. Sometimes it is and sometimes it ain't. Sometimes it's just us in our broken and willing flesh to do the wrong thing sometimes we do it and we along with the enemy can seat things on the throat of our throne of our hearts that make us feel comfortable that allow us to kind of recluse away from the the issues and the things we have to deal with in life it is spiritual i'm telling you it's spiritual you know and i think the way that we take steps away from this and and this is going to be a hard thing for some of you people, but it's going to help some of us understand why we do what we do. We need to develop the skill, the art of denying our flesh. We need to learn how to say no to just stuff in our life sometimes. Why do you think prayer and fasting is so important? Because it's teaching us to be surrendered to God. Sometimes we just say no to things, not bad things, because, you know, some people, when they fast, they fast food. Food is a good thing, you know, it definitely is. But when you take a day to skip a meal and when you feel those pains of hunger and you say, you know what, Lord, I feel hungry right now, but what I need more than anything, more than food is you and your presence in my life. And you have that reminder of what the real priority of your life is. It begins to reorder your life. And when you learn the art of saying no and denying the flesh, it gives you a supernatural ability when things come that want to compete for your attention they want to take your eyes off of Jesus, you can do this amazing thing. I should have made a slide for it. You can say this awesome word to those things. And you can probably guess it with me. And if you think you know what that word is, say it with me now. No! You can say no to those things. Look, social media is a great thing. I'll, I'll take a week and won't go on Facebook. Nothing wrong with Facebook. But sometimes I just want to be able to say, you know what? No, that's not going to have any of my time or attention this week. It's not bad, but I can deny the flesh. 
I'm not one of these guys, and there are people out there, I realize that this can be a compulsion for some people because there's likes and comments and shares on Facebook pages, and they feel a sense of like affirmation on their social media pages. Hey, if that's you, in love, I say this. Why don't you say no to that? That's not healthy. That's not helping you, and that's not real affirmation. You're living for just this fake constituted thing out on the web. When God says that he wants to do something real in and through your life, when you could actually go and talk and connect with and impact a real person and help them move forward. And there's going to be something that would happen there in situations like that when you free yourself up from the things that are consuming your time, that God could actually do something incredible through you you never even thought possible. All right? You're always a slave to whatever's on the throne of your heart. So how do we put God back on the throne of our hearts? And this is what we're going to finish with. Just three quick things and we're done. Some of this is going to seem really simple. I have a tendency to try to make things really simple, but yet anybody that sits here knows the simple things that we show you and we teach you are not always easy. In fact, they're rarely easy because they require the power of God working through our lives to see them happen. So here's how we do it. If we're going to tear down these strongholds. If we're going to tear down the stronghold of addiction, number one, you have to put God first in every area of your life. You might say, well, I've tried the God thing and it just didn't work. Listen, I'm telling you right now, if you put him first in every area of your life, your heart and your attitude are going to be very, very different in terms of what he's going to do to work these things out of your life, to free you from them. Because that's what salvation looks like. Salvation is not checking a box and saying, I went to church, or I read my Bible, or I did X, Y, and Z thing. No, it's, it's putting God first in every area of your life. 1 Peter 3.15, it says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as, say it with me, Lord. That means he's first. He is the one that you're submitted and surrendered to in every area of your life. You put God first in every single area. Christianity, following Jesus, what is it? What does that mean? It's not, it's not living a perfect life. It's not going to church a lot. It's not just someone who believes. It's placing Christ as number one in my heart. That's what following Jesus is. When he comes first and gets our best, he's going to destroy the strongholds that want to drag us down in life. So how do we put him first? Well, we give God the first of everything. Let me make it practical for you. When you wake up in the morning, the first words out of your mouth should be something along the lines of, God, thank you for another day. Or thank you, Jesus, for, for, for allowing me to have breath in my lungs. Or just good morning, Lord. Acknowledge him first. When a decision comes up that has to be made, your first default shouldn't be, well, let me go talk to so-and-so about it. First, it's, no, 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 I've got to spend some time in prayer. When a good thing happens, you rejoice in God first. When something difficult or stressful or bad happens in your life, you run to God for help and strength instead of other things that surround you. He becomes first in your life. And I want to say this really practically for you if I can do it, all right? Because when, when you put God first, God will bless whatever we bring to him first. Oh, I didn't get any amens on that one. I'm going to say it one more time. God will bless what we bring to him first. He might take a mess, and we bring it to him first. And watch what he does with that brokenness and that mess. And if we get this in our mind and in our heart, we'll actually be able to see him take that first place in every area of our life. Number two, say no to the flesh. Say no to the flesh. That's why our prayer and fasting journey over the next uh, 14 days, because we we're a week in now, is so important. We're learning how to say no to the flesh. You've got three parts that make up your body. Your spirit, and that's the part of you that's clean, that, that's kind of like God, that, that God communicates to your spirit. You know, when we, when we say things like, I feel God speaking to my heart, that's God, that's, that's God speaking to your spirit, Okay. So your spirit, but you're also soul, and your soul, that's like your mind, your will, emotions, your conscience. Some, some people would say that's like your personality, okay? So you got your spirit, your soul, and your body, all right? Now, all three of these things want to be in charge. All three of them want to be in charge of your life. 
They all want to be in charge. And you know who the strongest one's going to be? The one you feed. You have to make the choice. When you say no to the flesh, you're not feeding that sinful desire anymore. You're feeding your spirit. When you yield the things that you crave or desire to pull your time and your focus away from God and say no to that and say yes to him, you're feeding your spirit. You're strengthening your spirit, your soul, and your body in a healthy way that's going to draw you closer and closer to Jesus. So master the art of telling your appetites no, even if they're not bad appetites. you just got to figure out how to spend some time Moving away from the things that seem like they're addictive. For some of you, put the phones away at the dinner table. Do it. There are families that allow kids to stare at their phone the entire time. They're sitting at dinner together. I love you so much when I say this. You're doing it wrong. Okay? Like, no more. Let's, let's not do that anymore. Spend time connecting with one another. Understand there's a time and a place for that just like anything else. When you grew up as a kid, your parents didn't let you play video games 24-7, did they? No. They said there was a time and a place for that. Balance some things out in your life. You've got to figure out what those are, but this is the bottom line. If we're going to learn how to take control over those attitudes, appetites, and actions so that we can live out the scripture, so that we can live this way, we've got to be able to say no. The Bible says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Like, think about it. You might have a, a, a desire in your heart. Man, I'm, I'm sitting alone. Looking at television, a lot, a lot of us, especially guys, some ladies in here struggle this way too. Maybe you're clicking around the internet, I'd like to look at that. No. Say no to it. Like, I'd like to, I'd, I'd like to text some juicy gossip. No. Say no to that. Like, I have a tug in my heart to reconnect with a person that's not my spouse. No. Say no to the desires of the flesh because they are going to sometimes lead you down a path to destruction. Listen. And that's not me being legalistic and saying every relationship that you have outside of the relationship you have with your spouse is going to lead to an extramarital affair. But what I'm saying is you safeguard yourself against things because you never once want to think for a second that you're above being able to fall and stumble in sin. Learn to say no to the desires of the flesh. I mean, like, let's make it practical. I'd like to go to the Chinese buffet. Listen, I have fought against food illustrations in this sermon harder than anything that you will probably ever understand over the past seven days, okay? All right. You might want to go commit gluttony at the Chinese buffet, but you say, no. <laughs> Amen. Somebody should say, help him, Lord, on that one, right? I mean... Do not allow sin to reign in your mortal body. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God. For sin shall no longer be your master. This is the way that we're going to live this out. We're going to say no to the flesh. We talked about it in Galatians. Galatians 5.24. It didn't say if you want to get sin out of your life, you play with it. Or you massage it away, or you just slowly kind of walk away. Okay, okay, I'll come back, but I'm going to walk a little further next time. Okay, but I'm going to come back, and then I'm going to get a little further away. No, that's not what you do. If you want sin out of your life, Galatians 5.24 says you kill it. It says that those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Let me make it practical. Whatever I starve, die. Whatever I starve dies. Crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. Say no to the flesh. You don't work on your addictions. You kill sin. You surrender your heart to God. And that's how he's going to bring transformation. Whatever I starve dies. Here's the third thing. Don't let it sound cliche or kitschy or whatever. This is, this is just the truth. You got to go all in. Go all in with Jesus. Like I said earlier in the message, some people said, I've tried Christianity and it didn't work. I've even tried these very practical and simple steps that you've given me towards this. It just, it didn't work. Listen, maybe for some of you, you say that. Well, I would say you didn't go all in. Christianity is not dipping your toe in the water, man. It's jumping with both feet. You're getting immersed and you're getting completely remade. And it's not from the outside in. It's not that you're trying to get some constructs around you that make you look more Christian so that you'll have a life. No. It's about surrendering 
all of you and all of your flaws and all of your brokenness to a real and living God. Jesus Christ, he lived a perfect life without sin, and he decided because of how much he loved you that he would lay that life down freely for you. He did that by going to a Roman cross and being crucified, offering his life, spilling his blood to pay for the sin of this world, yours and mine. Because God is real and God is holy. He can't even be in the room with sin. And we could do nothing about this on our own except for pay the debt of sin with our own life. Amen. But Jesus stepped into our place and died the death that we deserved. He did something for us that we, would, we could never do for ourselves. He freed us from sin. You see, the only choice that we ever have is a final payment of our life as a payment for sin and eternal separation from God. But Jesus stepped in and sacrificed himself so that we would forever be reconnected and reunited with God. Because when he died on the cross, he didn't stay dead. Three days later, he rose from death to life again, proving that everything he said was true, defeating sin and death and the grave. And when I said he defeated sin, that means this. Every stronghold that you have in your life is defeated. You are not fighting for victory from a stronghold. You are fighting from a place of victory to take hold of what God has given you. Listen, he didn't just die on the cross so that you could be forgiven of sin. If, he, if he, that, that was the only reason for Jesus' death, he didn't have to die. Because, you know, in the Old Testament, they sacrificed bulls and goats and doves for that sort of thing. Jesus died not only for you to have forgiveness of sin, but to have power to overcome sin in your life. Power to overcome strongholds in your life. I think about it this way. If you're going to go all in with Jesus, you're going to surrender your life to him, you look at it like a person that, that you, you've seen these radical body transformations, right? You've seen these things on these late night shows on TV when you're flicking through the channels eating ice cream and potato chips about these people that have had these amazing body transformations. If that didn't happen by laying off the ice cream and taking the stairs at work. You know what I'm saying? It took going all in to see that kind of result happen. And in the same way, God wants you to be free and live a life that's transformed. You're not going to look like you used to. Because you're going all in and surrendering your life to the master. I love what Romans 12, 2 says. And this is what we're closing with. I'm going to read this to you from the message. It says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life. You're sleeping. You're eating. You're going to work. And walking around life. And place it before God as an offering. Sounds a lot like this 21-day prayer and fasting journey we're taking. Take the practical. Surrender that to Him. God, what do you want with this? What do you want with my eating and sleeping, my coming and going, my friendships, my workplace? What does it look like? Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for Him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Why prayer and fasting? Listen. There are things that creep into our hearts and lives, the influence of culture that's all around us all the time that wants to pull us away from the knowledge of God. We are going to take those lies and replace them with the truth of God. And what it takes is denying the flesh from time to time and saying, Jesus, I want more of you in my life and less of that. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Nobody at Peak City Church is coming and saying, stop acting that way. Stop acting, stop acting that way. No, 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 no. My heart is crying out today saying, let Jesus into your heart and life. Surrender all of whatever that is to him, all the bad and all the stuff that you think is good. Say, God, I want to give it all to you because I want you to work in and through me. That's what he desires. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you and he develops well-formed maturity in you. So let him in. Whatever I starve dies, but 
whatever I feed thrives. What are you feeding your soul? Let's pray. Hey, we're so glad you watched today's message online with us. We want you to know that if there's any other messages you'd like to see, you can check those out at peakcity.church forward slash messages. If you'd like to support the work that God's doing through Peak City, you can be a partner with us by heading over to peakcity.church forward slash give to give a tax deductible gift today. Thanks so much. We can't wait to connect with you again soon. Take care.